I don't know why Zoom always like lets people in like two at a time. It's like literally it's recreating the experience of being in an info shop, you know, like you can't just yeah, have all right. 60 people show up at once. You got to have like two come through the door at a time. That's why I'm standing for this is so that I can be slightly uncomfortable the whole time. That's perfect. People, it's really the info shop experience. Yeah. Okay, it seems like the participant count is slowing. Here we go. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. I'm excited to host this event tonight with Eric Larson, author of Polymath, The Life and Professions of Dr. Alex Comfort, author of The Joy of Sex. Uh, Eric is joined tonight by writer Margaret Kiljoy, uh, host of the podcast, Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff. They'll be discussing uh, a unique character um, who many on the left might not even be familiar with, the British poet, anarchist, and biologist, Alex Comfort. So Firestorm is a 15-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Uh, we're continuing to do some events online, uh, like this one, um, both because we do really love to be able to reach folks at a distance um, and bring in authors who maybe can't make it to an in-person event, and also because we know that COVID continues to be a barrier for many folks to participate in public events. If you're interested in learning about upcoming events, either in person or online, uh, you can follow us on social media and uh, I'll share a link to our newsletter in the chat. So tonight's event is a fun one for me um, as a longtime friend of both Eric and Margaret, uh, two prolific anarchist authors whose work is really well represented on our shelves. In preparation for this conversation, uh, I actually looked back over Firestorm's calendar and found that uh, we first hosted a book event with Margaret in 2009. Uh, and we were fortunate to have Eric join us for a conversation uh, on his previous book, uh, Exploring the Meaning and Origin of the Modern State in 2021. Uh, if you missed that, I'll drop a link to the recording in the chat as well. So here we go, we're gonna get started. Eric uh, is an independent journalist, historian, and activist. He's the author of The People's Pension, The Duty to Stand Aside, and The Operating System. His work uh, appeared in a wide variety of publications, including In These Times, The Nation, uh, and the Arkansas Review. He lives in Buckland, Massachusetts. Margaret is a trans feminine author who has spent her adult life uh, traveling with no fixed home. Uh, a 2015 graduate of Clarion West, Margaret's short fiction has been published by Tor.com, Strange Horizons, Vice's Terraform, and Fireside Fiction. She's the author of A Country of Ghosts, The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion, and The Borrow May Send What It May. She's also the host of the podcasts Live Like the World is Dying and Cool People Who Did Cool Stuff. Uh, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and pass off to Margaret to take it from here. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited about this event. I'm really excited specifically to hear the story of Alex Comfort, but also to get to be in conversation with uh, with Eric. I first noticed Eric's writing with the People's Pension a while ago, and I was like, there's, I sometimes like talk shit on anarchist history for being kind of like not feeling like people are excited. And I, I think that Eric's excitement comes across in his writing. Um, and like, I'm excited for what people are able to make with the space of history. And then I'm really excited to be sort of part of doing that with people like Eric, who've been doing really amazing stuff with it. Um, and so what I thought was, I'm going to read this book. I have this book, but what I like doing on my podcast is um, either not telling my my guest what I'm going to be talking about so they can't do any preparation, or I like 
um, not doing any preparation and then having an expert come on and tell me a story. And the reason I like that is because I think that um, I like having an audience stand in because I like having personally, I often get more out of a conversation where it's not like two smart people who know the thing talking about the thing. I like sometimes like the person who knows about the thing explains to the person who doesn't know the thing. So I'll be taking the role of doesn't know the thing. And I'm going to explain the little bit I know about Alex Comfort <laughs> going into this. Okay. Um, and tell me I'm wrong. You can, you can interrupt me now if you want. Of course. Um, and, um, oh, and Liberty just pointed out in chat, we are using the Q and a function tonight. So, uh, we're going to do this. Um, I'm going to make Eric explain this story, but then there's going to be space for questions and closer to the end of it all. So if you have questions, you should feel free to ask them in the Q and a form on the thing. Okay. So Eric, what I know about Alex comfort is that, I mean, basically what I know is that like a long time ago, someone was like, did you know an anarchist wrote the joy of sex? And I like, I cataloged it away in my list of weird anarchists invented everything folder with like foosball. Cause like it was a um, Spanish civil war veteran who was injured, who wanted to keep playing football, who invented table soccer or whatever. Right. right. Um, and so I just like had it in my list of like neat shit anarchists have done that I want to know more about, but it turns out he wasn't okay. The other thing I know is I think he wasn't just like a sex guy. I think he just like liked all sex also, and then did a ton of stuff. And then also, I think that his story is going to tie in a whole ton of all of the like politics of the 20th century in a really cool way. That's what I have. Is that yeah? How am I doing? That, that's that's a hundred percent accurate. <laughs> cool. So um <clears throat> My job then is to uh, is to kind of is to explain who Alex Comfort is, you know, what he uh, why and why we presumably we should be talking about him right now, and I'll just I'll I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a preface um, <clears throat> in terms of how I originally found out about him, uh, <clears throat> and of course it goes back to the joy of sex. I was a thirteen year old kid in San Francisco growing up and. I'm in a bookstore one day and I see a stack of these books with these very plain covers on them that say <laughs> the joy of sex. And so naturally I picked up one and furtively looked through it and you know the drawings, the paintings and so forth, uh, <clears throat> you know, all the time wondering whether somebody's gonna come up to me and say, hey, little boy, put that book down, <laughs> which maybe because of the fact that it was San Francisco, nobody did that. So I, you know, uh, and and the book was a bestseller. I mean, every time you know you looked, it was it was it was plastered on the bestseller list for years after that. I mean, it was it it uh, sold something it sold something like twelve million copies to date. Uh, it was it topped the New York Times um, hardcover bestseller list for something like thirteen weeks, and on and on. I mean, I could I could cite sales records this book had, so it was a huge deal. Um, some years later, I'm in college, and I looked up a, um, a reference book called Contemporary Poets, and for something I was writing, and all of a sudden, I saw a reference to Alex, an entry for Alex Comfort, and I thought, this is, is that that same guy who wrote The Joy of Sex? Because I see poems and novels and criticism and all this kind of stuff, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I filed that one away, and uh, then a few years later, I was when I was a journalist, you know, I was starting to write this book about the history of the social security debate in the United States. And that required me to find out a little bit about gerontology, which is, you know, the study of human aging, because social security is, a, is a, essentially uh, 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 our sort of re retirement income support program in the United States. So all of a sudden I found, I run to Alex Comfort again, he was a gerontologist. He was a major person Shit. in that okay. field who kind of helped turn it into a respectable branch of science in the mid 20th century. And so, you know, uh, again, there's Alex Comfort. A few years after that, um, a friend of mine, uh, you know, I was sort of thinking about writing something about the state from an anarchist perspective. What is the state? What does it do? What's it all about? And this friend of mine suggested a book called Authority and Delinquency in the Modern State that was like a kind of a psychosocial examination of the state that argued that 
the state is in some ways a, a, a sociopathic creature that attracts other sociopathic creatures or people to take leading roles in it who then do things like napalm villages in Southeast Asia and build walls against uh, immigrants and all this sort of thing. And that book, uh, Authority and Delinquency in the Modern State, was written by Alex Comfort. So all of a sudden, I mean, at this point, I'm starting to think that I, I keep running into this guy. I wonder if there's a, a biography of him. Can I find out more about him? I found a Wikipedia entry, but there's no biography. So <clears throat> this is usually my my sort of MO is I decided, well, there, there needs to be a biography of him, obviously. And the fact that he was an anarchist was, was definitely uh, an inducement. So I started to work on the book and... Um, uh, I just kept turning over, turning up more and more things that he was involved in that it's like you say, uh, it, 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 it linked him in with so much of 20th century radical history, cultural history, and so forth, that um, it became really a kind of a, a almost a, 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 like a biography, but also kind of a quasi history book in a way. Um, you know, very early on, I mean, I can I can sort of sum things up a bit as Alex was, he was a poet and novelist, he was a gerontologist, he was a geriatrician, he was a pioneer to some extent in the treatment of, of, old, of older people um, uh, uh, by, by in, in terms of health care. Uh, he was a, um, uh, one of the founders of the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the post-war decades in the UK, which means he was one of the founders of the nuclear disarmament movement uh, globally. Um, he was a pacifist. He was an anarchist political thinker uh, and theorist. Um, he was also uh, he also wrote some significant works on uh, phenomenology, the the understanding of the self. Uh, and um, uh, social biology. So sort of he was he was interested in how in 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 how why uh, human beings seem to be wired for religious or spiritual or uh, what they call oceanic or mystical experiences, where that comes from. So he was he just spanned so many different areas um, that it was really kind of staggering. And I was a little intimidated by that, but I was also very intrigued. Um, so I'll tell you what, why don't I start out with just a really thumbnail sketch of who he was and what his life, you know. Okay, I have, I have one question first, though. Yeah, yeah, sure. Was he into the mysticism stuff? Was he like, this <laughs> rules? Or was he like, why the fuck do we keep having gods? A, a little of both. Um, cool. You know, awesome. I, I won't go into a ton of detail, but Alex, um, uh, and this gets right back to his early life, he grew up, he was born in 1920. And he was um, kind of an academic prodigy. His father was a, a civil servant. His mother was a teacher who kind of brought him up speaking French before, practically before he could speak English. She taught him, she was taught, teaching him Latin and Greek before he started to their equivalent of grade school. And he went to, um, he went to Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, started okay. there in 1938 and he finished during the war. Um, and at that time, um, sort of what you would call um, scientific humanism or positivism was a big, was was kind of the dominant philosophy there. Uh, Wittgenstein was, had the chair in philosophy at Trinity College at that point. And so Alex was very much in those days, sort of a scientific empiri uh, empiricist. You know, he okay. was he was pretty much the opposite of a mystic. Um, and that's a lot of, a lot of what he wrote, a lot of his, his basic thinking stayed that way. But in the 50s, he became very, very interested in India and in, uh, in Vedic philosophy. And he traveled to India quite a bit. Um, he translated the Koka Shastra, which is an Indian um, basically sex manual from several thousand years ago. It's, it's like a companion book to the, the, the Kama Sutra. Um, he learned Sanskrit in order to translate that book. And as he started to, to study Indian uh, philosophy more. And then later on in the 70s, he got very interested in um, uh, quantum physics and in sort of the new physics. And as a result of, of this kind of study, it kind of decentered his idea of what the self is. And he became very interested in how 
people have experiences which take them be beyond the self, beyond the sort of like, like subject object way of looking at things. And uh, so, yeah, he 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 uh, he never really stopped identifying as sort of a secular, you know, um, uh, uh, more or less atheistic uh, humanist. But he also became very interested in, in in trying to update that with what we know from Vedic philosophy, from um, uh, uh, from the kind of mystical experiences people have. And he had he had some interesting theories about why we're wired as humans to have experiences like that, why it seems to be part of our kind of evolutionary makeup. Um, cool. So that that's the, the short, <laughs> okay. short version cool. of that. Um, okay, so, so now give us the biographical sketch. He's born yeah. in England, right? Yeah, born in England. Uh, okay. So we can't hold that against him. Uh, no, no. Uh, he uh, uh, he was. Um, uh, I think his. I think his two favorite countries in the world actually were Ireland and India, uh, <laughs> which he visited every chance he could get. Um, oh. But uh, so there he is. He's at Cambridge University in the early forties, and he's studying medicine. Um, he became a physician. Uh, but at the same time, he was publishing his first poems and novels. Um, his first book actually was published in when he was 18, and it was a travel book about a trip he and his father made to, to South America and the west coast of Africa. Um, so he was a published writer all before he was even at university. But he was making a name for himself as a poet and novelist. And during the Second World War, he was a pacifist. He opposed, he, he um, was a, a dedicated pacifist and he campaigned very strongly against the, against the bombing of civilian targets in, in, uh, in continental Europe by the British and the Americans. And he became, uh, he was actually blackballed on the BBC for a number of years for doing that. Uh, but he was instrumental in, in getting a lot of famous people in Britain to sign statements opposing civilian bombing. Um, so already he was he was becoming very politically active. And he his anarchism actually developed out of being a pacifist. He uh, he felt at a certain point that in order to in order to oppose war, you have to oppose you have to be willing to oppose the state in a very, very active way. And so you have to be in, in a way that, that 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 anarchism is kind of the philosophical uh, underpinning of any kind of pacifism. And from that, he started exploring anarchism more and started to write about it a lot in the uh, by the late 40s. Uh, he was a uh, he was a member of the Freedom Press Circle. Freedom Press was the kind of leading British um, uh, anarchist publisher in the 40s. And Alex was a big part of their their sort of scene. Um, so after the war, he um, uh, uh, not surprisingly, he became a critic of the bomb. Uh, he uh, he um, uh, was one of the first people in the UK to write uh, 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 denouncing the dropping of the atomic bomb. And he became a very active member of the Peace Pledge Union, which was the leading pacifist organization in the UK. It's kind of the counterpart of the War Resisters League here. And um, so by the end of the 40s, he was very active in that respect. Uh, around the same time he was getting his PhD in zoology uh, for studies he did on mollusks, and he was recruited. Cool. Uh, he was recruited to um, to go to to University College London to study human aging, which was beginning to become a major field at that point. And um, he established himself in the fifties as one of the the, the leading uh, authorities in the world on. The, the theories and the uh, and the the study of human aging he did he it was, it's interesting because he was also one of the first people to review the uh, the Kinsey report in the UK okay. when that came out uh, and it's interesting because he was studying he was studying mollusks at the time when Alfred Kinsey got to start studying wasps you know they were both kind of zoologists before <laughs> Before no, they I got mean, it, and yeah, then Kropotkin and, was a biologist, and like, exactly, yeah, no, that's and, cool. And they recluse. Yeah, there's a there's a kind yeah. of a there's a long line of 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 um, biologist anarchists, you know, yeah, throughout the history of the movement, uh, and so Alex was definitely part of that. Um, so by the fifties, that and 
one other thing in the 40s is he starts writing about sex. Um, and uh, this is 25 years before the joy of sex was issued. He was already writing about the subject. This is actually, I don't know if you can see this, this is Alex Comfort's first book on sex. And it's called uh, Barbarism and Sexual Freedom, Lectures on the Sociology of Sex from the Standpoint of Anarchism. And it was published huh. by Freedom Press in 1948. And um, wait, who who printed that edition that you're holding? That's free. It's Freedom Press. Is that is that an original? Is that from the yes, 40s? this is. Oh this shit! Is Someone should put it back into print. All right, <laughs> it it should be yes. Um, the and and I'll 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 focus on it for a second because um, Alex wrote and spoke about sex and became a very uh, well known figure in the UK. Um, as, you know, people were starting to, in the 50s and 60s, when people were starting to really push back against the more repressive laws and more repressive practices in terms of sexuality. Um, he, was a, he was a major supporter of um, the, the burgeoning gay rights movement in the 50s, for example, um, and wrote quite a lot about that. But what's interesting about this book and a couple of others that he wrote at the time was that he was starting to develop Kind of a different way of looking at sexuality um, than even a lot of people on the left had because at the time uh, people like Wilhelm Reich who were sort of the sex radicals of the day were um, tended to uh, you know there was a kind of a, a weird agreement between them and people who were more repressive about sex that sex basically had two roles uh, pleasure and procreation, not necessarily in that order. And um, there was a kind of a view that on the left that bad sex could possibly equal bad politics, that, you know, that sexual repression led to uh, other problems in other areas politically. And Alex sort of turned that on its head. Um, he was more of the opinion that um, that that it was it was a, 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 that you couldn't really separate sex and society, that when you had uh, a, a repressive, um, precarious, economically exploitative, violent society, it affected the sex we have. Now, why okay. is that important? Because Alex felt that there was a third uh, role for sex, uh, which was what he called sociality. Um, you know, so, so um, socialization, if socialization is how we, um, uh, is how we learn to to absorb the kind of the rules of society and follow them. Alex felt that sociality is how people learn to cooperate. They learn to practice a kind of a mutual aid. You know, what are your needs? What are my needs? How can we arrive at a way to meet both of them? And that that's that that's something people start to explore when they explore sex in their teens. So Alex was, for example, not he was very at the time teenagers were just not supposed to have sex. And Alex was actually very encouraging that teenagers should be encouraged to explore sex, at least on, on a superficial level, because it, it helps teach them how to practice sociality. You know, it, it teaches them to cooperate and rather than abuse or dominate each other. It, it teaches them, it's one of the ways they learn to have a give and take as opposed to competition. And okay, so, so I, Alex, I'm oh, sorry. No, I, I like this because there was this um, one time I was on a bus and I found a magazine in the trash and I was reading this magazine in New York and it was a biology magazine and it was talking about, and this is like maybe 20 years ago, and it was talking about like new thoughts in biology around gay animals. And its whole thing was like, actually, alongside Darwin was this other evolutionary biologist who was really important. His name was Peter Kropotkin. And um, right, right. And and he has this whole thing, you know, the old anarchist guy for anyone who um, he, he has this whole thing where, you know, mutual aid is a factor in evolution. And that's like basically like us getting along is a really important part of us succeeding as a as a species and as a people and, and our own individual lives and shit. Right. And so this was making the argument that animals that this was like the current biological understanding of of gay animals, right? Is that it's not an accident. It actually still increases the uh the the species survival chance to have homosexuality. And like, and I really like that because that was the anarchist take 
from 150 years ago applied currently. And so it sounds like Alex Comfort was like, did that more directly. He was like, with humans, this is how we build. What do you, what was social, soci, what was it called? Sorry. Sociality. Sociality. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, he, uh, well, I should point out that that by the time he wrote Barbarism and Sexual Freedom, Alex was very conversant with Kropotkin. He knew Kropotkin's mm -hmm. work. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, and, and, and of course, this is where the politics and the sort of the sexology come together is because sociality is what Alex saw as kind of the kind of the underpinning of mutual aid, which, of course, is what Kropotkin was talking about. Yeah. Uh, and that if that you know if we can if we can aspire to a society that is built on mutual aid as opposed to on uh, to capitalist competition and so forth sociality is essential to that um yeah. and so that was kind of alex's idea was that uh was that if you have a violent society uh it impedes you know it it, it affects our sex lives you can't divorce the two and so it impedes uh the ability of of our sexual practices to encourage sociality we don't have sociology it becomes harder for us to cooperate on a larger level as well that leads to violence that uh. leads to problems so you get this sort of vicious circle going mm -hmm. and this was an idea that alex first brought up in this book and he developed it over the next 25 years um or so and in some ways the joy of sex is his attempt to kind of smuggle that agenda into the popular discourse <laughs> in the guise of the sex manual because there's lots of passages in the joy of sex where he talks about this in kind of a sub rose away um so wait anyway, what's a sub rose away sorry does that just mean like oh, under the words, surface in other, yeah he's not using the word anarchism or okay. or even mutual aid but he's kind of conveying the idea anyhow okay um, cool so uh by the early 60s um alex was probably <clears throat> one of the better known um public intellectuals in the uk he was on the bbc all the time he produced a couple of documentaries for them uh he could he was on regularly talking about everything from uh from uh the sexual revolution to human aging to uh nuclear weapons and the need to get rid of them and so forth um he was an organizer in um, 1961. He and Bertrand Russell and a number of other activists attempted to organize a mass sit-in in, in Trafalgar Square against American nuclear bases in the UK, which they were campaigning to have removed. And oh, yeah. he, was, he and Russell were arrested and he spent a month in prison uh, basically for, for uh, attempting to, to organize this uh, this the sit down demo which happened anyway by the way um and so he was uh, arrested before it happened but then it went happened yeah. without him yeah he was I, arrested for encouraging it and yeah. aiding it and so forth this um, is one of the things i love about anarchist organizing is like oh no you got the leaders right right okay uh, they, they arrested about 36 leaders and it didn't make any difference the people yeah, people yeah. did the sit down anyway cool. um but by the so by the but by the mid so by the mid sixties he's um, kind of a notorious person. He's uh, well known as an intellectual, as as an anarchist. Um, and round about this time, um, the sexual revolution is really taking off. Um, you know, a key date in the UK was a court case in nineteen sixty one when. Um, uh, the ban on Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence was lifted. And all of a sudden there was an explosion of uh, more or less explicit books being published in the UK. Uh, Alex at that point was doing his translation of the Coca Shastra, um, which, was, which was published a couple years after that. Um, What's his personal life like at this point? Like, is he, is he yeah. married? Is he like, I'm just imagining the guy who's like, Sorry, I'll come to bed, but first I have to learn this other language so I can do this thing that's completely unrelated to the field that I'm in because I just really want to do it, you know? But like obviously believed in anyway. So what was his personal life like? Well, his you know, his his first wife, and I'll get to that in a second. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, but... I get to it when it comes. Yeah, yeah. He, he he had a good he had a well, he was at, at this point, we were talking the early 60s. He's married, he has a young son mm -hmm. uh who's uh getting ready to uh to go to university. Mm -hmm. Um 
and he has a like I said a fairly pretty quiet satisfactory home life um and uh all of a sudden he got a bit of a, of a he had a bit of a midlife crisis he started uh -huh. an affair with um he had, he started he and, and, a, and a family friend named Jane Henderson started an affair and um and he for the next dozen years he had essentially uh uh he was he had this kind of arrangement where he was spending the weekends with his wife in a little London suburb and spending weeknights with Jane in her flat in London. And he and Jane began ex basically. Uh, did, did everyone know or no? It was kind of an open secret. Um, like, but know, did, his, did his wife know? Like She did. Okay. She did. Okay. Uh, and, but cool. she, it, it kind of worked out in an odd way for all concerned at the time because his wife, liked the life they had together. Um, Alex liked the life they had together. He just, there was this other thing and Jane was in love with him. And so, um, you know, everybody sort of put up with it in this kind of British way, like keep calm and carry on, you know, for about a dozen. There, there is something very English about it. Is we just Yeah, like, yeah, totally. Okay, this doesn't work, but we're just gonna make it work anyhow, what the hell and so yeah. forth. Um, so he and Jane got, had, started a very, very active sex life, let's put it that way. <laughs> and um, they were experimenting with all kinds of things. At this point, Alex had, Alex was very close, in close touch with the Kinsey Institute. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, they were swapping uh, artifacts and information constantly. And Alex had quite a collection of, um, of uh, <clears throat> anything from, you know, underground Soho, red light district newspapers to, you know, uh, uh, 16th century Italian uh, sex manuals to third century BC Chinese sex manuals. And so they were going through all of this, he and Jane, they kept a notebook. They <laughs> took the book club themselves. They were, you know, they were really kind of experimenting. Mm -hmm. And Alex began to think around this time that uh, one of the things that's missing what he began he began to look at the kind of sex literature that was out there and he found there were two problems with it number one is that an awful lot of it was uh was salacious violent um misogynistic etc uh and and really and his number one complaint in a way was that um is that rather than uh you know um uh, uh, help people get rid of their anxieties about sex. It was actually making them worse. Um, you know, and that was always his complaint was in a way is that is that our society makes sex anxious. It makes it something you get neurotic over as opposed to something that should be helping you achieve sociality. Um, at the same time that if, if you wanted to read something that was, uh, you know, over the counter as opposed to under the counter, it was often... Um, extremely medical, extremely boring, um, scientific, you know, scared to death of appearing to be pornography. Um, you know, Alex was friends with Masters and Johnson, uh, for example, and when they published Human Sexual Response, Bill Masters literally said they tried to make the book as unreadable as possible because they didn't want it to be banned. Uh, <laughs> but the book was a bestseller. That book was a bestseller. Uh, a couple of years after that, a couple of books came out that were also big sellers. One was this book called Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. Uh, and then there was another by an anonymous writer called The Sensuous Woman. And Alex read these books and he just became enraged because he felt like, again, they were uh, everything you always want to know about sex was very homophobic. It had all it had all kinds of misinformation in it. And the sensuous woman was basically, in the guise of a sex manual, was basically a book about how to, you know, how to uh, um, how to please your man. It was basically a book for women who want to please their man. And so, Alex one of those like is, marriage manuals, like, so you're married. Here's what you got to fucking put up with now. Or, or yeah, you know, um, uh, greet your husband in the doorway with a with a a, a martini and wearing a, a negligee, you know, as yeah, surefire, yeah. that that kind of stuff. So Alex thought this is the wrong direction to be going. And he thought what's needed is, um, is, there, is some kind of a modern version of the sex manuals they had in India centuries ago or in Renaissance Italy that were sort of 
they showed you how to do it in a relaxed and kind of um, aesthetically nice way. Uh, they de they demystified it, got rid of the anxiety, and he felt we need something like this now. So that's why he wrote Joy of Sex as kind of an antidote to what we had and also as an attempt to revive this kind of centuries old genre that had kind of died out. Um, and so that's one of the reasons, for example, that the first edition of Joy of Sex was illustrated partly with um, classic Indian and Chinese uh, erotic paintings, uh, was to kind of link it up with this tradition. So yeah. that was one of the things that got him, that, that persuaded him to do the book. Um, and what was, uh, what was unique about the book was this, uh, you know, when it came out, people were very taken by the they, they, they illustrated it with paintings and drawings rather than photos. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I could spend another hour talking about the making of that book, like how the publisher, what they how they designed it and so forth. It's, it's quite a story. But the key thing about it is this, is that is that Alex developed a kind of a, a voice for talking about sex in that book that was humorous, relaxed. It was all geared towards sort of making you not be upset or neurotic about what you're doing. The assumption is you are a, 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 a couple who's, who's sexually experienced, who wants to have better sex and is not embarrassed by it. And so oh. that assumption, if you, if you look at the book, was his, 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 his idea was if, if, I can, if I can present sex that way, people will become less anxious about it. They'll find, they'll find in it something that is pleasurable and not something they have to be embarrassed about. Uh, and we're going to put out a book here, by the way, that a, a suburban American couple, couple can put on their coffee table and not be embarrassed by it. So that was the goal. Um, and that was kind of, I, I think that was that was the big innovation of the book was it it showed you how to how uh, it it opened up a new way to write about sex, a new voice you could write about sex in that wasn't cheesy and uh, and lewd, but it also wasn't overly serious and scientific. It was in between. You know, it was something an ordinary couple can pick up and read and enjoy. Um, and of course, what happened after the book came out is first of all, it became a huge bestseller. Uh, which it was just almost unavoidable. He was Alex was a household name in the U.S. for for years and years in the '70s because whenever they wanted to have somebody on uh, on TV to talk about it, they would um, uh, they would uh, it was always Dr. Alex Comfort here with you know Mike Douglas or Merv Griffin or whoever. So Did he, he had got, his mustache the whole time. Was that like his no, thing? No, no, he'd gotten rid of the mustache. Oh, okay. And he had longer That's hair. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. That no, that makes sense. Yeah. But he was he was kind of the perfect person in a way to to um, to be the to be the kind of front man for something like this because he was he was very English he had this kind of tweedy sort of uh, appearance he was obviously an intellectual and so forth and so you could watch him being interviewed about sex and being very witty and sort of knowing about it and and not feel like you were watching a porn star or somebody like that. Um, so, uh, and, and this is the interesting context, I think, is that at the same time that you had sex radicals like everybody from Annie Sprinkle to David Wojnarowicz uh, to, um, you know, later on Dan Savage uh, pushing the boundaries, at the same time you had Alex Comfort and the joy of sex sort of bringing it into the suburban home in, in a kind of a slightly more genteel package. But with these kind of, but with a kind of a, an anarchist um, yeah. uh, agenda, kind of, you know, sewn into the fabric of the thing. That is so fucking cool. Like, <laughs> I, I like that it's not the most radical thing. Like, I like the radical shit too. The like really radical in your face stuff. But I really like that instead. It's like, um, yeah, I really like that he consciously thought about. What you're saying where he was like, well, I want to break this like spiral of shame that I actually think yeah. is directly related to violence. Like I was expecting to see like, how did his anarchism inform his writing? But now I can kind of see that it's sort of the other way around too, right? Because he was using this writing as an intervention in society where he was like, I want to break this like 
place where violence is part of people's lives way too much because of shame, because of, um, I don't know. I, okay. This is really exciting. Okay. Please continue. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, because, uh, and, and, um, uh, that's something we can talk about a little more because Alex always said, uh, when he was asked about it anyway, uh, when people said, how can you be doing all these different things at the same time? You're, you know, gerontology, anarchism, sexology, biology, et cetera. How does it all fit together? And he would say, it's all part of the same project. Yeah. Uh, and, and in writing the book, that was kind of what I had to decode was what is that project? Because he never he never spelled it out. And so I had to figure out what is it? Mm -hmm. And um what I eventually came up with, I think, if if this isn't if it's not simplifying it too much, is that his project, you've got to remember that he, he again is he came out of this kind of positivist scientific humanist background in the 40s in, in his education. And his his project was really was to understand the human, understand what it is to be human, what makes us that way, and how we can and 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 how we can sort of uh, uh, fulfill ourselves as such, how we can have a better society as good, uh, how, how we can be as, as good humans as we possibly can to each other, because he understood being, be, being human as being a social thing. It's, and that again, gets back to his anarchism is it's, 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 it's uh, anarchism is what we, uh, you know, in terms of mutual aid is what we strive for as social creatures and sex is part of that. It's not separate from that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, um, you know, I, I think part of the difference to get back to your original point is that um, is that uh, on the one hand, he is that the difference between him and somebody like David Wojnarowicz at the time is that Alex, I don't know who that is, to be clear. Oh, uh, David Wojnarowicz is an American artist, uh, writer who was a major uh, sex radical in the 70s and 80s, among other things. Okay, he cool. Was a, uh, he learned his trade as a as a Times Square hustler. He uh, his he he uh, produced art that was banned. Uh, okay. He was really cutting edge figure in terms of that uh, yeah. at the time. And I sort of use him as an example because David Vachnerovitz's idea was partly to outrage people, you know, and to do things that were transgressive and uh, outside the boundaries. Um, Alex's idea was more to take those things and to normalize them, you yeah. know, that, I mean, it, it, you know, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, homosexuality or trans, you know, his idea, what, what he would have said is, um, why should anybody be, think this is outrageous? This is just two things two people do between each other and, and they're not causing anybody any problems. So why should anybody uh, hassle them about it? Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of his 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 answer to the religious right, literally, when he talked to people on the religious right, is that is to normalize, uh, is to persuade them that they were the ones who were being being weird by yeah, making an cool. issue out of these things. They, well, he kind of turned the table on them. That was that was sort of his approach to everything. Uh, and he did that over and over again. It's interesting to listen to his talks and to his uh, when he was in conversation with people on the other side, because that's always what he would do is he'd kind of turn around the thing on them. You know, why are you so obsessed with this thing? You know, uh, that was kind of his line. Um, and that was, and ironically, of course, that's the other, the other important thing about the joy of sex is because after that book came out and was successful, a flood of sex manuals came out. We've had bazillions of sex manuals published since then all of which do a little bit of what Alex did. They, 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 they take in some ways that voice he developed that's very casual and humorous, and um, and used it in 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 other books. Uh, and in in fact, there was a whole slew of um, fundamentalist Christian sex guides by people who who would in some cases <laughs> denounced Alex that, uh -huh. that basically used the same approach and even somewhat the same structure for their books. Uh -huh. So. Uh, you know, and, and we've got a bazillion different variations ever since. So I like to say that it's 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 very difficult to write a book like Joy of Sex now, because you even if you're just talking about heterosexuals, you can't really pretend that you're 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 creating a book for everybody in that group because there's so many mm -hmm. different 
you know, very different sex guides for any number of different uh, people's proclivities. Um, on the other hand, any sex guide you read these days, any sex manual you read these days, in a way you're reading at least an echo of what Alex did in Joy of Sex. He, he did succeed in taking that genre and kind of, you know, which went back thousands of years and reviving it for the modern world. And now we have a million different sex manuals. Okay, so, so was he like, was he happy about that? He was like, haha, my work here is done. Or was he kind of like a little bit jealous and bitter that everyone was ripping off his idea? Because I could imagine well, being mostly the former, but being a little bit the latter if I was him. Well, he was he was not jealous of of anybody who um uh who did a similar book. Yeah. Because I think his, you know, he did write other things about sex after that. But he'd basically done the book he wanted to do, and that was that. Um also he could probably retire off of it. So it it did it did make him rich. I mean, uh, he was somebody who'd, you know, he was a well known person and so forth. But he'd always lived a little bit hand to mouth yeah. up till that point. All of a sudden, he just had all this money showering in on him. Um, yeah. So he was able to quit his his research job and move to the states for a period of time and pursue other things. Okay. Um, but he and later in life he referred to joy of sex uh, occasionally as an albatross, and you know, is this, this thing hanging around his neck. And, but he never, he was never sorry he did the book. I mean, in his later years, he used to say that he really hoped to be remembered mainly for his poetry, uh, a lot of which is very good, but, um, you know, it's in terms of social impact, it's just, there's no, there's no comparison. Yeah. Um, but he never, but he, he was always, he, he, he constantly heard from people. He, I mean, he got mail, of course, like you wouldn't believe. And he had all kinds of people asking him for advice about this and that. And so he was always very gratified that he'd done something that that helped people, that literally helped people who uh, had problems or hangups, as they called them back then, uh, yeah. to get over them. Uh, or to, you know, um, when Alex died, Dan Savage did a did an obituary for him in The Times. And, Dan, and, and you know, Joy of Sex wasn't specifically for, for, it wasn't, I mean, it talked about uh, homosexuality in about half a page. It wasn't really the subject of the book. Right. So it was basically a heterosexual book, but Dan Savage said, uh, as a 15 year old boy, uh, finding it in a bookstore, you know, and then hiding it behind a whole bunch of other books so he could come back and look at it whenever he wanted to, that <laughs> it was a good book for him because it helped him to find his way around a man's body. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it was, I mean, Joy of Sex is what there was back then. If you wanted to buy a book, it was obviously was the first sex manual explicitly illustrated that you could buy in a mainstream bookstore. Yeah. Uh, they were not supposed to sell it to you if you were younger than 18, but plenty of people looked at it. I mean, I found all kinds of references, you know, um, to the book from people who, um, are, are fairly well known in terms of sexology who said, you know, uh, the joy of sex was the first book that was available to me that beat looking at national geographic, you know, <laughs> that, that my parents had, that wasn't, <laughs> that was actually about kind of people I could recognize having sex with each other. Yeah. So, um, the book, uh, it, it, it went beyond its audience is what I'm saying in terms of what it actually, in, in terms of how it was meaningful at the time. Okay, so to, to go back to the biographical sketch, yeah. so he's written this book, he's resting mm -hmm. on his laurels, he's spending all of his money on um, cocaine. I'm just making part <laughs> things up now. But he's, he's, he's very wealthy, he moves to the States for a bit. What what else? I, well, I have no he, idea when he dies, for example. Clearly oh, yeah. Dan Savage is alive when he dies, but that's all. Yeah, so I'll, 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 get, I'll go through the rest of this. Is he, he moved to the States uh, in 1974 to take a position with a... Um, a think tank in Santa Barbara. And at th by this point, he'd divorced Ruth and he'd married Jane. Um, mm -hmm. So second second marriage. Um, Alex's idea in the States was to do more gerontological work. And also he'd become very involved in geriatric medicine. He felt that there was a crying need for, um, for uh, uh, doctors who understood the special needs of older patients. And there are very few people like this at the time. And so he wanted to use his position to sort of kickstart geriatric medicine as a practice in the United States. It was really kind of in its infancy then. And um, he quickly ran into some brick walls with that. He, he testified before Congress, he wrote, he, he lectured. 
didn't get very far with it. Uh, at the same time, the think tank he was part of imploded. He wound up suing them. Uh, and about 10 years after he had moved to the States, he moved back to the UK. Uh, by this time, he had uh, he was uh, he actually wrote a couple of pioneering books. One of them was on uh, sex, uh, basically uh, uh, sex problems and uh, accommodation of the needs of disabled people uh, okay. in terms of sex. He also wrote a lot about the need to accommodate um, very, very old people in terms of sex and, dis and, and uh, dispelling a lot of myths about uh, people in their 70s and 80s who were expected to be, back then were expected to be sort of asexual almost. And uh, just that's in the past. And he insisted, no, these people, oh, people yeah. have sex needs throughout their lives and should be accommodated. And so he, he, was, re he was really pushing that and crusading on that, on those points, um, came back to the UK and at this point, he got into some really, really different areas. Uh, he started writing about the biology of religion, as we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And he started doing a lot of work on quantum physics and the origins of the self and the human mind and wrote a book, that, a really challenging book on that subject that I was scared to death to read before I got into it. And then I read it. And of course, Alex was, as you say, he was a communicator. He was a mm -hmm. really good writer. It was that's one of the things that's pleasant was fun about doing the book is his writing is just fun to read. And he was getting into that work. <clears throat> he was also a, a, a savage critic of the Thatcher government. He wrote a satirical novel about the Thatcher government called The Philosophers. It's really fun to read. <laughs> and then when Alex was 71 years old in 1991, and he was just he was just done preparing a new edition of Joy of Sex, he had a massive stroke. And he spent the last nine years of his life uh, more or less in a nursing home. So oh, he sure. died in 2000. Okay. But before he died, he managed to publish one more book of anarchist essays and one more collection of poetry, uh, which he had he wrote partly by dictating to his daughter-in-law. So you couldn't keep him down. I mean, yeah, that's one of the other fun things about Alex Comfort is he just he just you couldn't keep him down. Um, so uh, that kind of brings you up to date about his life. Okay. Um, the other question, of course, is, you know, what's his legacy? I mean, what do we, you know, uh, and I, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things because I know we want to get to questions and so forth. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so folks have questions. Feel free to yeah. use the, the question form. Um, otherwise, I'll be stuck asking questions. All right. Why would you do well, that to me? Yeah, let me see if I can wrap this up. Is that uh, uh, this part of it? Is that no? Yeah, tell us about the legacy. Yeah, yeah. Is as I as we've already talked about that a little bit in terms of in terms of sexology. Is that again this this idea about about the third role of sex in promoting sociology and is in promoting mutual aid? I think is an idea that's still, especially these days, in the days of where people are where finally people are really rising up against sex abuse. The, the, the Me Too movement has had, it's, has had a huge impact that uh, this idea of Alex is about the fact that you can't divorce sex from the rest of your life. And if you have a dysfunctional violent society, it's going to affect the kind of the, the sexual relations. It's going to affect relations between the sexes. And it's going to exacerbate the problems we already have with uh, male dominance, et cetera. That's something that I think is 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 a very is still something that's 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 a very very evergreen uh, point right now. Um, in terms of anarchism, uh, which we haven't talked about too much actually, uh, Alex's writings about uh, about anarchism in the '40s and the '50s I think are still really vital today because he he um, he was uh, a big proponent of the idea that. Um, in order, to, if it, first of all, uh, that the, the correct attitude towards the state and its crimes is an, an uh, is an attitude of extreme disobedience, and this is something he learned during the war when he used to say, um, "I'm not interested in 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 um, uh, in uh, uh, you know disobedience that is polite." and uh you know and cooperative i'm interested in uncivil disobedience 
uh, that you you have to you have to be in your face. You 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 can't be nice about it. And I think his his basic philosophy as an anarchist was that. Um, Remember, this is a time, this is the 40s and 50s. This is after Stalin. This is after uh, the kind of revelations we've had that 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 uh, socialist or communist revolutions don't always lead to the utopian society. His feeling was that was that you know a lot of people were calling this idea this idea of political revolution that's that's built around the idea of seizing state power into question. And so Alex. Alex's feeling was that what we needed was a kind of a social revolution in our culture uh, where people learn mutual aid, where there's an attempt to educate people differently underground and that and that that, that should produce a kind of a, a kind of an ongoing insurgency uh, that can grow and grow and grow kind of on the surface but beneath the surface that the revolution needs to be a long process that we're 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 dedicated to building year by year by year, as opposed to, you know, suddenly everything collapses and we take over the state and uh, we impose ourselves on everyone else. So that was the kind of anarchist he was. And I think that's something we're still we're still grappling with. And I think it's something that he was beginning to practice and he was beginning to formulate in the in the nuclear disarmament movement in the 50s and 60s when uh, in the in the UK, especially, nuclear disarmament had kind of the same cultural impact as the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam protests in the U.S. in the '60s. That it, it kind of created a new political culture among younger people that was was built around this idea of disobedience, of um, creating a kind of an alternative community within the movement. And that has its pluses and its minuses, but at the time it worked, and it, and it's 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 the kind of it's it's the kind of um, organizing that we're still building on today. Um, hopefully, along with a lot more strikes by the UAW and in, in places where <laughs> they need them, and 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 the wobblies and so forth. But that was that I think was kind of his idea there, and I think the other legacy that he had was as a humanist was, as you know. Uh, was this idea of focusing on the human and understanding the human as something that uh, that we need to cultivate and um, and you know remove some of the, the 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 problems and the anxieties and the the violence that the state builds on it that the human is something we need to take seriously as a value um, and so I I think that. Um, I mean, it's it's a rich legacy, and I think that uh, there's an awful lot that he wrote, a lot, an awful lot that he said that's very well worth keeping in mind now. And um, uh, I'm I'm hoping that my book helps people to sort of understand kind of what produced all this, which is a fairly phenomenal person, I think. Yeah. Okay. Wait. No, I'm sorry. I completely lost the thing I was going to say, but I want to ask. Oh, Liberty came on possibly to ask questions from the list, which is what I was. Is that why you came on? Hi, Liberty. Hey, <laughs> I've messed up my own view here. Let me see if I can get it back. Hmm. There we go. I can see awesome. you. Yeah. Cool. Y'all, this was has been great. Um, And we do have some questions coming in from folks uh, in the audience. Um, And I'm going to just quickly kind of grab a few of them and throw them at y'all. Um. And uh, yeah, the, the first one, which I think is is timely and excellent, um, Kit has noted that today is TDO, uh, TDOR uh, Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, yes. And it, it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, Alex did not uh, spend a lot of time addressing um, uh, transgender communities, or at the, I guess at the time, like transsexualism. Um, uh, but Kit asks, and I think it's a good question, about this idea, um, which of course comes up when we talk about uh, the murder of uh, trans folks, um, of, uh, let's see, the idea of panic defense, right? And so Kit yeah. asks, did Alex ever address the concept of panic defense where someone is supposedly so upset by realizing that a sexual mm -hmm. partner is trans that they kill them? Um, and if, if, if Alex didn't address this, which I imagine may be the case, um, what do you think he would have to say about it? And Kit notes that, um, you know, I, I consider it a defense invented by lawyers for the accused 
for the indication is that the opinions of others, society, have an impact on our behaviors in private. Yeah, I, I, uh, he, you're right that he, that's not something he addressed specifically, but I think I'm on pretty firm ground in saying that he would have found that, that defense to be completely specious. Um, and I'll tell you why, because in the 50s, Alex was very involved. This was the 50s in Britain was at a time when there was a conservative government that was really rabidly anti-gay. Uh, they, they, they were arresting people in huge numbers, uh, using laws that had, that had hadn't been, that, that had really been almost ignored for a long time. There was a kind of a, uh, it's, it's, it's not even, it's not clear why it happened, but there was this sort of government crusade against, against gay people and people were being outed. That's the period when Alan Turing killed himself, uh, supposedly. Um, and uh, there was a report issued by the British Medical Association that was incredibly homophobic at this time. And Alex uh, was given the job by The Lancet, which is a major British medical publication of answering that, um, that report. And he took it apart. And his, uh, it's interest, it makes interesting reading in terms of what we're talking about, the panic defense, because he, 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 he didn't just talk about what was wrong factually in the report. He talked about the language of it that it was stigmatizing, that it, that it dehumanized gay people, that it made it seem like it's that, that, it, that, there, that it was okay to treat them anyhow because they are sick, et cetera. I mean, the, literally the adjectives were just incredibly damaging. And so, and underneath his critique was this idea that uh, you're, you're taking a, a population which is already culturally stigmatized and you're making them vulnerable. Uh, and that this is this is absolutely wrong. Um, and so I think that you can it's a, it's it's just a small step from that critique that he made of uh, the, the British Medical Association report to uh, an analysis of the uh, of the um, the panic defense, which would take it apart as being something that's that that is manufactured by a society which is putting out material that encourages people to think this way about these people that dehumanizes them. So I think, yeah, you can kind of see in embryo what his, uh, what his, what his critique would have been of that. Um, I kind of want to like piggyback on that and ask if he wrote much about uh, the trans stuff that was going on during his time at all or not. It is, I will say, however, it's really nice to like, often when there's like old anarchist uh, forebears that I'm like, Oh, that's the wrong word. Whatever. People came before us. Um, like, usually I'm thinking, oh, what would they have to say about, you know, transness and stuff like that? And usually I'm a little bit afraid. And so it's like kind of nice to be like, I feel pretty sure that Alex Comfort wouldn't be like mad that Liberty and I exist. Right. Like, like, I don't, <laughs> Not but, like, but I'm wondering if he did address it at all or if, um, if how, like, if you have a sense of how he would feel about the like explosion of um, gender and sexual identity that that were, is currently happening, yeah, it's it, that's a it's a good question. It's it, it's not an, a super easy question to answer because again, we're talking about this person was writing was active a long time ago. Um, Alex was a uh, uh, was was of the opinion, and remember, he's uh, well. First of all, I should I should mention that. That uh, again, he was doing. He was collecting stuff at the same time the Kinsey Institute was. He was interested in every aspect of human sexual behavior, and so he was collecting stuff from uh, like uh, rubber goods manufacturers and mm -hmm. uh, Soho nightclubs and all kinds of stuff. He was aware of all kinds of different sexual identity and sexual practice, but his way of kind of analyzing that. And we're talking about the 60s, remember, the 50s and 60s, was to say that um, there's no such thing as entirely gay and entirely straight. Uh, or there's it's we're all on a continuum, that we're we're all it's all mixed together and some are more one way or the other, et cetera, which is an okay position to take. But in the 70s, uh, he was actually often called to task by the gay rights movement because. They were there. They were finding their liberation in being a distinctive community, and 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 saying we are distinct, we are different, we're what we are, and accept us for what we are. 
And so um, Alex, at, at, uh, on a couple of occasions, was asked to endorse a statement for uh, um, uh, one or another gay rights movement uh, in the UK or in the US. And he would sometimes say no, because he'd say, I don't want to encourage people to identify just as one or just as the other. And of course, at the time, that was not a helpful attitude. Um, I think that these days, um, he would probably, I don't think he would say the same thing. I think probably he would be very uh, positive about the trans movement because it would, again, it, it, it muddles these, these, these categories. <laughs> it, it, uh, it encourages people to, to not just be one thing or the other. Uh, or not identify just in 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 one cut and dried way. Um, mm. So I uh, he he didn't really address the trans um, issue back then, other than to think of it as sort of like, gee, it's it's, it's really neat that people are doing things in many different ways. Um, but he but I think these days he probably would have taken a very positive attitude towards. He would have found it to be a positive direction just for everybody on some level. And picking up on that, I'm wondering if you could say a little more about things that um, like a, a contemporary audience um, might find uh, find dated or or even maybe distasteful um, in Alex's uh, work, uh, either as an anarchist or as a sexologist. Yeah, um, you know, I'll uh, uh, I'll mention one thing that was kind of well, first of all, let me let me preface it by mentioning something where he was kind of ahead of his time. Right about the time he published Joy of Sex, he published an article which got reprinted quite a lot called Sex in a Zero Growth Society, in which he basically introduced the idea that with the pill, for example, um, and with the breakdown of the, you know, sort of the, the traditional marriage, it was time for us to start thinking about different kinds of households, that why do we just have to have households with two parents? Can't we have households that are more communal? Where, kid, where children are brought up in more of a communal kind of way, um, where they're not- So uh, I'm, I'm hearing a family abolition strain here. Yes, and he got attacked for that quite a bit. And people you know, people accused him of smoking pot and so forth when he talked about that. And <laughs> uh, you know, of course today, especially in, in, in gay or transgender households, you have, uh, and and other kinds, you know, you 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 do have experiments of this sort of this sort going on. They're not even just experiments anymore. So that was another way that he he was kind of ahead of his time. But um, you know, in the interest of giving you the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, I'll, I'll I'll quote a line from the Joy of Sex that I don't think anybody would agree with these days. Uh oh, That's all right. The way put it. So Hold my ready. <clears throat> okay. Quote: Most women profess to hate it on prospect. But the expression of erotic astonishment on the face of a, a well-gagged woman when she finds she can only mew is irresistible to most, most men's rape fantasies. Now, in 1972, this was he, he could think of this as sort of a funny joke. Um, mm -hmm. These days, not so much. Uh, you know, and, and again, we're, we're talking about a book which as far as I can tell, was the only book that is the only book that was ever positively reviewed by both Ms. Magazine and Screw Magazine, you know, Al Goldstein's sort of sex publication. So it appealed to a lot of people, but but there's but there are things like that that you it's it's a product of its time, you know. You 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 just we just don't talk that way anymore. It's not funny. Um, and so you will occasionally find something like that in uh, you know, because Alex felt that fantasies were an important part of, of sex. They're an important part of the important part of the, the give and take, even. Um, but to him, a fantasy was a fantasy as a fantasy. But today I think we would say a rape fantasy, that's something else. That's not the kind of thing that that we want to include in that, in that, um, you know, in in the curriculum, uh, you know, with each other. So there, that that gives you an idea of sort of what's changed between now and then. Let's put it that way. Uh, but I'll give you an, I'll give you an, I'll give you one more passage from the book um, that gives you a little bit of an idea of what is contemporary about it. What I think people would really still find really compelling in the joy of sex. Um, quote: Sex is not just intercourse; it's everything involving touch in the human body. 
Uh, the aim is to help people express all of themselves, our whole skin surface, our feelings of identity, aggression, and so on, and all of our fantasy needs. Sex is the one setting where it's not forbidden to do so. One's whole skin is a genital organ, he declared. So that gives you the idea too. And I think that's what that's one of his legacies in a way. And one of the good things about the book is he wanted to he wanted to expand the idea of what is sex. It's not just intercourse. It's something that involves all of us, every, all, every aspect of us at any time. Um, it's not just an act, you know, yeah. and it's a, uh, a real a queering of sex, even within the context of a very heterosexual book, it sounds like. Um, right. Pulling right. another another question from the Q&A. Um, DB is asking, you know, how is it that um, uh, Alex's work has to some extent fallen through the cracks of history? And it, and I guess it hasn't in that clearly you ran into Alex's work everywhere you turned. Yeah. And yet many of us have like either never heard his name or, or perhaps have heard it in passing and not kind of solidified an understanding of who he was and his contributions. Right. Okay. I can address that. Um... One reason is, of course, I mean, the joy of sex, you know, he occasionally used to refer to as an albatross because it it kind of overshadowed everything else he did. Um, I think that's, you know, the, the last edition of the joy of sex actually came out in 2008, eight years after he died. It's actually a really good update. If you get your if you get your hands on it, it's actually quite good. Um, but I, I think what's happened is, is twofold is that, first of all, um, is that, again, there's been a bazillion Sex, sex guides since Joy of Sex, all of which owe a lot to his book in one way or another, but they've kind of, um, they've kind of left it behind also. Uh, they appeal more directly to different audiences. So the Joy of Sex is not such a, everybody's heard of it, but it's not, it's not compulsory reading anymore. Um, as far as his anarchism goes, uh, you know, if you talk to people in the UK, he's still a pretty live name in the anarchist community, but um, again, uh, you know, there's there's just a lot that's come out that's come out since then. And I think that um, also uh, Freedom Press, to some extent, I think, dropped the ball on some of his publications. They're not as easy to find anymore, although there's a, there's a couple that are still available. Uh, the one I'd really like to see reissued is Authority and Delinquency in the Modern State, which is a brilliant book. Um, and it's been out of print for about 40 years now. Um, in terms of his scientific work, it's like with anybody's scientific work, is that people have done more work on aging and uh, geriatrics since then. And and he always said, you know, this work of the this stuff is going to be is going to get superseded. That's just that's just how it works. Um, and as far as his as his fiction and his poetry go, um, a lot of it is worth is is worth looking at again. But uh, uh, but his the the school of poetry he was involved in in the 40s got kind of superseded by some others since then and so it's sort of luck of the draw um i i'm personally hoping that 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 we can get some of alex's work more of his app his work back in print soon because uh like uh, some of it including barbarism and sexual freedom is is well worth reading i also think that there's like a thing with anarchists in general where you know there's a lot of Whenever I run across anarchists that are famous for something that is not anarchism, no one knows about their anarchism. And yeah, I think that that's yeah. because the idea of anarchism does not make any sense to the average person who is educated in our, you know, in our society or whatever. And so like, so that's left aside because it's too messy to explain or doesn't fit into this picture we have of, you know, this person. And so, so it just doesn't, get remembered like there's so many people who just are not remembered as anarchists and are only remembered as other things um, yeah and even when they're remembered as anarchists you know emma goldman for example there's a number of good biographies of her but a lot of them tend to sort of downplay her anarchism they look at her as a cultural and political figure but or a, and a feminist but they kind of soft pedal the anarchism like that's that's yeah. not something we want to deal with um yeah you know, it's not mainstream enough. That's yeah. that. That's unfortunately the case. Um, you know, there I, is someone uh, who's. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. More questions. Well, I was just 
going to share that um, someone has generously noted in the um, Q&A that uh, there is a free PDF of authority and delinquency that can be found online uh, from Libcom. Um, uh -huh. So uh, good to know. If anyone wants to check out that text, it does sound like you, you can scare up a, a copy of it. Yeah, and I would encourage anybody who's interested to to take a look at it. It's it's well worth reading, and it's not long either. <laughs> I nice also want to um, to try and convince people that they should also read this book. We're not going to talk about how Orwell snitched him out. If you want to know about how Orwell snitched him out, how he was the only anarchist that Orwell put on his snitch list, you're going to have to read the book. Yeah, that's uh, wow, book. that's enticing. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. wow. For us yeah. to not get to that tonight. I'll just mention that I, you know, that yeah, that that's that's a that's an interesting story in 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 my book, uh, Orwell, and I'm afraid that that, and I didn't use this word in the book, but I was I was continually um, attempted to to refer to them as frenemies, but I <laughs> I controlled myself. I didn't use it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna leave that content uh, off the table for tonight. You have to you have to go read the book. Um, there, there is one more um, kind of question slash comment here that I want to make sure we get to, um, which is about sex work. Um, and I am really curious. This is not the question. I am curious to know a little bit more about um, kind of uh, Alex's um, kind of treatment of sex workers and sex work um, and whether or not that might be something that we would find. I don't know. So often when you look at historic figures writing about sex, this is an area where they really fall on their face. But, um, Especially in the late '60s. Yeah. Okay. But before before we get to that, I want to actually read uh, this this question, which I think is is interesting, um, okay. uh, and kind of parallels that a little bit. Uh, but yeah. So anonymous says, "Thanks, this conversation reframed the term sex work for me a bit." Sure, there is the sex work currently done under capitalism, but I think now I can also think of my own sex work. Um, like I organize potlucks, like I mediate conflicts, I fuck. Is this a fair understanding? Does that a sex work? Yeah, the idea it that is... to some extent, like uh, all of us are engaged in. I mean, clearly this is not sex work in the term that that anyone uses it. Um, you know, not legible as sex work, but the idea that um, sex is part of how how all of us relate socially um, and build social cohesion or sociality, as you described it, um, kind of in line with, I'd like this list of organizing potlucks, potlucks and mediating conflict. Uh, do you yeah. have any, any thoughts on that? Okay, well, I could I could say that that not only would, would Alex have, have fully uh, endorsed that idea, but he actually lived it in a way uh, because Alex was involved for a couple for several years with a, a, an intentional community in California called Sandstone, uh, which was kind of famous at the time. It was a, a kind of a, I guess you could call it a kind of a free love community. He never actually lived there, but he visited there often, and he wrote about it in the sequel to Joy of Sex, which of course was called More Joy. Um, Sandstone, there was a documentary done about it, which you can find online. Uh, and they were, it was, it was sort of an, an attempt to create an intentional community that was, that was a large, a, a kind of an extended, a very extended family in which um, uh, sex was regarded as something that wasn't possessive. And um, that's something, there's, there's a very utopian kind of California hippie dippy kind of uh, notion to that but I but but Alex did take that very seriously that that sex should be something that is not again considered separate from the rest of your life it's not something that should be considered walled off from everything else um you know in sandstone there were no doors uh in the main part of the house because the idea was first of all people shouldn't be able to go out to, to go off and be do and dominate other people and that it, and that it's and that sex should be something that people are not ashamed of um, whether you want, whether, you know, anybody wants to pursue that or not, it was an interesting experiment at the time. And it indicates to me that what this person is, is, is describing is something that Alex would have aspired to, or he would have felt like this is something we should aspire to definitely. And on the question of, uh, sex workers rights and liberation, did, what do we know about Alex's, um, politics around sex workers? 
he 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 never wrote directly about that. Um, mm -hmm. He he did uh, write some papers that referred to studies that were done of um, sex workers in the UK in the fifties and sixties, and he supported he he was absolutely against the criminalization of sex work, for example. But and this is another uh, area where he was kind of a creature of his time, is that he. In, in, in some of his writings, he, he endorsed this idea, which was very popular at the time, that, that there's something pathological about people who do sex work, that they must have some kind of problem of uh, uh, hating men or problems in their upbringing. You know, I think today most people would simply say, well, they're doing what they had to do economically to survive. Uh, but so, but he, he felt at the time like he had to belabor this point that, that there's something there's some kind of personality that is a sex worker personality or streetwalker personality or something like that. So that part of his, uh, uh, that's a pretty small bit of what he wrote about sex though, but that that's one of the areas where I think you might want to ignore what he had to say. But in terms of sex workers rights, he would have been definitely right there defending it. And, and, hmm. and he was. Interesting. Um, I am going to put in the link, um... Uh, in the link, excuse me, in the chat for folks, uh, links to Eric and Margaret's uh, catalog pages on the Firestorm website. You should definitely grab a copy of Polymath if you don't already have one, um, and also check out both of these fabulous folks' other titles, of which there are many. Um, we are in our last few minutes. I'm sorry that we didn't get to every question in the Q&A, uh, but just want to make a little bit of space here at the end for any final thoughts um, from, from Margaret and Eric. And thank you all so much for this talk. It's been really very interesting. I think it's like with any historical figure like this, thinking about the sex work thing and things like that, right? It's just like, well, that's what's so nice about, one of the things that's nice about being anarchists instead of like someoneists is that we're like, okay, like, yeah, there's some stuff that he had to say. And I like really respect these things that he did. And I don't agree with everything that he had to say. I don't need to. We can be in com like we can be critical of some of the things that he had to say, kind of in the same way that you were saying about his science, you know, where he was yeah. like, "Oh, I did the science, and then other people did better science." And and I think that the sexology, or you know, I, I guess I don't hear people using that word too much, but I don't know that people are doing now. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, stands on his shoulders, and then fortunately, correct some of these things like the patholog pathologicalization of you know different identities and, and work and stuff like that but it's like all of my heroes around all this shit did that kind of shit that was what 19th century fucking gay studies was about you know and like i don't know i find it really interesting um and i i i love figures like this i love figures that just you know you can learn all this stuff about the whole 20th century by reading about this guy who moved through it and did stuff and was in conversation with all this stuff happening and seemed to have his head on his shoulders pretty well about it, like overall. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I like the, I, I, one of the things that drew me to him was not just the fact that he was engaged in so many different areas, but the, but he brought them together. They, they yeah. were all, they all kind of fit together for him into one thing. I mean, I just want to read one really quick sentence from another thing he wrote. Actually, this is from The Joy of Sex. Or no, actually, I'm sorry, this is from Barbarism and Sexual Freedom. He said, if we're able to transmit the sense of play, which is essential to a full, enterprising, and healthily immature view of sex between committed people, we would be performing a mitzvah. And I thought that was that was kind of an amazing statement to be making at the time. Um, it's, you know, it, that that it's 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 not just it's not just a good thing in terms of two people, it's a good thing in terms of everybody. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it seems like a good, good personal and political together. There you have it. Fantastic. Seems like a good note to end on. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is this has been wonderful. Eric, um, congratulations on another uh, incredible book. Um, you really produced some fantastic uh, contributions to the anarchist canon here over over the last. I don't know. When when did your first book come out? God. <laughs> Uh, the first book was, I mean, I've been writing forever, but the first book was 2012. Fantastic. Well, here's to, uh, here's to many more. Um, and, uh, thank you to everybody who joined in tonight. Really appreciate you. 
and look forward to seeing you again soon for another event. Well, thanks, Take Margaret, care. so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Good night.